In at number 5 we have Ava in Ava's Possession. Ava's Possession debuted at the Dead by Dawn Horror Film Festival in 2015 and centers around a young woman named Ava that has recently been possessed and successfully exercised but now she must learn how to put her life back together. The film begins with the priest successfully completing an exorcism on Ava who was stunned to find out that she has spent the last 28 days possessed by the demon Nafula. This demon was based on a natural real life demon by the name of Vapula who was a powerful great duke of hell that commands 36 legions of demons and is depicted as a griffin winged lion. This demon is a fallen angel and 60th of the 72 spirits of Solomon and has skills in philosophy, mechanics and sciences. Vapula also known as Nafula is mentioned in many readings throughout history especially in the world of demonology, magic and witchcraft. After Ava's exorcism she went from bad to worse when her actions brought her to cause serious emotional and physical damage which resulted in losing her job, friends, boyfriends and potential jail time. Her family urged Ava to accept a plea deal that would spare her jail time or committed to a facility for troubled ex-possessed people if she attended a rehabilitation program for the recently exercised. Ava began attending this program and it was urged that she took it seriously. If she didn't it was very likely the demon would return to her and she would become possessed once again. At a group meeting in the facility Ava meets Hazel, a fellow ex-possessed person that wants her demon to return since she enjoyed its presence and felt it was special for both of them. While Ava is trying to remember her missing 28 days, she discovers blood stains on her floor and is led to a clue where she soon finds out that when the demon possessed her, she had murdered someone. And she is just constantly thinking what she did to become a target of Nafula. After finishing the program, she soon starts to get her life back together until Ava discovers some old files revealing that her mother has also been previously possessed by the same demon, resulting in her finding out their bloodline is prone to possessions. Fun times. In at number 4 we have Pazoo. Pazuzu. Pazuzu is a fictional character who is the main demon in the exorcist horror novels and film series created by William Peter Blatty. The character of this demon was derived from Assyrian Babylonian mythology where the mythic Pazuzu was considered the king of the demons of the wind and the son of the god Hambi. He also represents the southwestern wind, the bearer of storms and drought. This demon is known to bring famine during dry seasons and excessive water during the rainy season and is considered to be an evil spirit by all. Pazuzu was often depicted as a combination of diverse animal and human parts. He has the body of a man, the head of a lion or dog, talons of an eagle, two pairs of wings and a scorpion's tail. Pazuzu first appeared in the Exorcist novel in 1971. The novel is about a 12 year old girl, Reagan McNeil, that gets possessed by a demon. The demon is later revealed to be Pazuzu. Even though they never state that he is the demon, two references were made about this statue, which was uncovered by Father Lancaster Merrin in northern Iraq. After Reagan's mother worries about her daughter being possessed, two Brees, Merrin and Karis arrive at their house to perform an exorcism on Reagan to force the demon out of her body. But in their struggle to free Reagan from Pazuzu, both priests die. Two years after the novel was published, The Exorcist was released in theatres as a motion picture. In the second installment of The Exorcist, Pazuzu is named as the demon and returns to haunt Reagan. The demon is prevalent in each and every movie released in the fourth Exorcist. Pazuzu was actually shown in his first encounter with Father Merrin in Africa. After the movies, The Exorcist became a television series and Pazuzu continued to pursue Reagan and possessed and killed her daughter. After killing Casey, the demon is able to possess Reagan again and is almost able to take complete control of her mind. With the help from a priest, Reagan tries to fight back against Pazuzu and the demon is successfully exercised from Reagan's body. William Peter Blatty's creation of Pazuzu and the Exorcist was based on heavily reported series of events from 1949. Fun fact, there is a true crime case involving a man named John Alexander Lawson that was a self-proclaimed Satanist and demonology lover. He was inspired by the famous demon Pazuzu and changed his name to Pazuzu to pay homage to the demon reference in the movie The Exorcist. In at number 3 we have The Taking of Deborah Logan. The movie The Taking of Deborah Logan is a 2014 American found footage supernatural horror film. It tells the story of a documentary crew making a film about Alzheimer's patients who uncover something sinister while documenting a woman who has the disease. The filmmakers and writers did not base this movie on characters on real life. Deborah Logan is a fictional demon but the most terrifying nonetheless. Though in the beginning they tried to make it appear as a real person, this film is about a team of students, Maya, Gavin and Louie, who to create a documentary about about a woman named Deborah Logan, an elderly woman who has Alzheimer's disease. As the film crew records her daily life, Deborah starts to exhibit increasingly bizarre behaviour, but her physician believed this is normal for someone with an aggressive form of Alzheimer's. The cameraman Lewis begins to notice that her actions defy normal explanation and believe that something supernatural is going on. Things grow more tense after the group notice that they have a recording of Deborah of her talking in French, talking about snakes and sacrifices, and her behaviour becomes so extreme that she is hospitalised. Deborah is possessed by Henry. 
Henri Desjardins, who had disappeared after a series of cannibalistic ritualized murders of four girls. If you want to find out more about this possession, you should watch the movie. There is no confirmed ending, and that is the most terrifying part of this demonic movie. Even though it's not based on true events, it really makes you feel like it is. It was voted 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, and Ain't It Cool News called it found footage done right and stated that it's one of the most effective entries in the popular subgenre of found footage horror. Coming in at number two, Dibbuk, The Possession. The Possession is a 2012 supernatural horror thriller based on an article written by Leslie Gordstein called Jinx in a Box, and the story that was created by Kevin Manis. In 2003, writer and furniture refinishing business owner Kevin Manis purchased a cabinet from a yard sale and claimed it was haunted by a Dibbuk, a concept from Jewish mythology. The word Dibbuk comes from the Hebrew word evil. The term appears in a number of 16th century writings and is a malicious possessing spirit believed to be the dislocated soul of a dead person. It supposedly leaves the host body once it has accomplished its goal or after being exercised. The box gained notoriety when Kevin auctioned it off on eBay, including the story claiming that the cabinet was previously owned by a survivor of the Holocaust in Poland, who said it contained the malicious spirit of a Dybbuk, and that the box had paranormal powers and was responsible for this bad luck and nightmares. This box went through a few hands before being sold to Jason Haxton for $280. The museum curator and collector of religious paraphernalia began to research the source of the box and launched a website about it called DybbukBox.com that reportedly received hundreds of thousands of hits and created what's been described as an internet legend. In 2004, Jason sold the rights to the story to a Hollywood production company and that created the 2012 release of The Possession. The movie tells the story of this so-called demon box, when a dad begins to witness his young daughter acting strangely following the purchase of an antique wooden box with Hebrew markings on it at a yard sale. The little girl became more and more obsessed with this box and her behaviour becomes increasingly erratic and alarming, ultimately leading to the girl becoming possessed by the demon haunting the box. In 2021, Kevin Manis came out and told Input Magazine that the Dibbuk box story was entirely fictional that he came up with it. And finally in at number one we have the exorcism of Annalise Michelle. Anna Elizabeth Annalise Michelle was a German woman who underwent 67 Catholic exorcisms over the span of a year and her story inspired the 2005 film The Exorcism of Emily Rose, the award winning 2006 film Requiem and the 2011 film Annalise The Exorcist Tapes. When Annalise was 16 she began to experience seizures and was diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Shortly after she was also diagnosed with depression and was treated by a psychiatric hospital. By the time she was 20 she began to hear voices telling her that she was damned and would rot in hell and began to hallucinate while she was praying. Her conditions began to worsen, was depressive and put on different types of medication. After 5 years on psychiatric medication failed to improve her, Annalise and her family believed she was possessed by a demon. As a result the family reached out to the Catholic Church for an exorcism, while rejected at first two priests got permission from the local bishop in 1975. The priests believed Annalise was in fact possessed by a powerful demon from hell and knew they needed to do anything they could to force this creature out of the girl's body. The priest began conducting exorcism sessions but through all of this she stopped eating food and passed away due to malnourishment and dehydration after a total of 67 exorcism sessions. The story of Annalise is still told by many to this day and it's believed to be one of the most real and powerful stories of demon possession in history. Coming in at number 5 we've got Doris's demon. Damn, Doris, where'd you get this demon? There are all sorts of different accounts as to how this possession went down, but if you take Doris and her children at their word, it's hard to ignore what happened. Back in the early 1970s, the home of Doris Blyther came under attack by a plethora of ghosts and demons. This seemingly average house in Culver County, California suddenly teemed with paranormal events many of which traumatized poor Doris. A single mother taking care of four kids, Doris was having a good deal of trouble on her own. Add in a history of abusive and violent relationships between Doris, her parents, and partners, and you can see how life might have been tough. Doris claimed that she was being assaulted by the ghosts in her house, and this was corroborated by one of her children. They could remember hearing their mother being attacked and violated by these spirits and didn't know what to do about it. The kids also remember being attacked by invisible presences, scratching, pulling, biting, and slapping. Skeptics looking into the case point to her history of abuse and alcoholism as major factors in these events, saying she likely wasn't being attacked by ghosts, but instead in some sort of terrible fugue state. But when a team of paranormal investigators came in, they found some strange and compelling evidence. 
unexplainable bruising all over Doris's body, ghost orbs throughout the house, and other possibly paranormal activity made it seem as though there could be real demons hanging around. However, Doris and her family did eventually leave, apparently taking these demons with them. Subsequent residents in the house did not report any such activity, and Doris claimed that these presences actually followed her after she left. All of these events were drawn upon by author Frank de Folita, who wrote a book called The Entity, and this tome would later be used as the basis for a feature film of the same name. Now, get this. During the filming of the movie, a young actor fell and broke his arm. He was playing the part of one of Doris's sons who had broken his arm in a similar manner while living at the house. They claimed they were thrown by some unseen entity, so maybe there's a connection here after all. Coming in at number 4, we've got the Changeling. There are many tales of demons and monsters throughout history. Folklore from all over features different entities meant to scare any who come across them. One particularly prevalent figure in such tales is that of the Changeling an inhuman presence used to replace a human child. It's a very scary notion, don't you think? Your kid, who you're watching grow and change and become a fully developed person, gets replaced by something almost impossible to detect. What can you do at that point? This idea is explored in a bunch of different ways, from old fairy tales to particularly recent movies like The Hole in the Ground. But if we look back to the 80s, there's another tale of changelings that seems to be based on true events. A movie, The Changeling, was released and claimed to have been based on true events. Martin Scorsese lauded it as one of the scariest horror movies of all time. Russell Hunter, playwright and musician, had been living in the Henry Treat Rogers Mansion in Denver, Colorado. While here, he discovered an abundance of creepy details. The cheap rent and exquisite architecture came at a cost, of course. During his stay, Hunter experienced plenty of paranormal happenings, from noises without obvious origin, to poltergeist activity, to, most interestingly, a secret room. Apparently, in this hidden chamber, Hunter found a diary penned by a young boy who was trapped there for an extended period of time. Through reading the diary and following some of the clues left behind, he ended up finding the remains of said young boy, who had seemingly been locked away by his parents. Tragic and terrifying for sure. Hunter then sought out a medium who came and investigated the mansion. Through this investigation, it was discovered that the spirit of the boy had remained in the house for almost a century and was behind much of the paranormal activity. Later, while the mansion was being bulldozed to make way for a high-rise, a bulldozer operator was killed in a freak accident. Could that have something to do with the mansion's history? Was the boy replaced by his family, doomed to rot within the walls of the mansion? Or was there a more supernatural replacement going on? Of course, the movie dramatizes a good deal of what happened, but the fact that it was based on the experiences of Hunter while he stayed at the mansion so rich in history is is cause enough to be intrigued. He says that the hauntings did actually follow him even after the mansion was demolished. Coming in at number three, we've got the Dybbuk. Recently, there's been a surprising amount of talk about Dybbuk boxes. For an ancient, cursed object, there sure is a lot of interest in 2021. A lot of this has to do with people supposedly purchasing mystery boxes off the dark web and then opening them on camera as a sort of spectacle. Of course, this has played up a fair bit to encourage plenty of views, so one can assume anything they're watching on the so-called dark web on YouTube is probably fake. But a recurring theme inside of these large mysterious crates is Dybbuk boxes, ancient wine boxes meant to seal away vicious and evil spirits. Of course, the best way to deal with something like that is just leave it well alone, don't break the wax seal, but that's not going to consistently happen now is it? They open the box and 2012's Raimi produced the possession and come face to face with a malevolent spirit that wants to possess a child. Once that thing is open, there is no going back. Apparently, after they wrapped shooting, a mysterious fire broke out in the prop warehouse, burning everything to the ground. Sheesh. You can also look to Post Malone's recent experience with a Dybbuk box at Zach Baggins' Paranormal Museum, where he claims he's been haunted ever since. With all the attention this demonic item has been getting recently, one has to wonder about the veracity of it all. But maybe don't try to find out for yourself. Coming to, we've got Beleth. The King of Cats. What a fantastic title for a demon to have, right? Folks who like to stay right up to date on horror programming might recognize that name. Recently featured in Netflix's Marianne, Beleth could be a lot of things. If we look to compendiums of demonology, Beleth is known as a fallen angel, one who leads 85 legions of demons and is a mighty and terrible king. When summoned, he's very angry, and if you show any fear, he'll never respect you again. The actual King of Cats bit doesn't seem to be mentioned anywhere outside of the Netflix series, but if we take these traits as true, he does seem very cat-like. Side note, a bottle of wine might mellow him into compliance, which is nice to know. 
But yeah, Belleth is supposedly a summonable demon and one who could work with you if you play your cards right. But like with any demon, you've got to be careful lest you give up your soul to this otherworldly entity. And coming in at number one, we've got a haunted doll. And this time, it's not Annabelle. I just figure we've got a very complete knowledge of that tale from the Warren archives. This haunted doll made waves back in 2013 as it flew in the face of the idea that haunted dolls are ancient and made of cracked porcelain. Yep, this haunted doll was made in the image of the one and only Ice Queen, Elsa. A family decided it was time to get rid of the doll and tossed it. However, soon after, it reappeared within their home. It was programmed to sing bits of the song Let It Go, but eventually it stopped doing so and would only speak in Spanish. Understandably freaked out, the family once again attempted to rid themselves of the toy, but it came back again, this time appearing in the backyard. It's a determined little bugger, eh? These days, it's strapped to the front of a friend's truck and it hasn't found a way to escape yet. Number five on this list is Father Urbain Grandier. Father Urbain Grandier was born in 1590 in France and lived until 1634. He became a priest in the town of Loudon in 1617 and was a priest right up until he was burned at the stake in 1634. That's right guys, Father Urbain Grandier's story takes an ugly turn when he's linked to making some serious deals with the devil. Urbain had some negative rumors start to circulate around him in 1629 when he was being accused of sleeping around with a lot of women. It was even thought that he was the father to a son of a married woman, however that was never 100% proven. The slander surrounding his name reached an all time high when in 1632 allegations of demonic possession started to form. A group of nuns began having very strange and vivid dreams with Urbane appearing in them. They also started acting very funny and not feeling like themselves. It all started with Mother Superior Jean de Agnes. It's written that, unfortunately for the tortured nun, no amount of penance kept her dreams at bay and soon the other nuns followed in her footsteps. This plague of nightmares swept its way through all of these nuns and they all reported having Urbane in their dreams. The nuns started to fling accusations at Father Urbane Grandier and said that he'd gotten a demon to possess them. The demon that most people link to this possession is Asmodeus, who's a prince of demons, a demon that represents lust. That being said, a bunch of other demons were tied to this possession as well. Zabalon, Iskaren, Astaroth, Gresil, Amand, the list goes on and on about the possible demon or demons that Father Urbane Grandier sent down to haunt these nuns. Considering his character was already getting called into question, it wasn't difficult for people to believe that he'd called upon Asmodeus to do his evil bidding. A trial took place following the reports, but the verdict of guilt was swift and after some extensive torture, Father Urbane Grandier was put to death by being burned at the stake for making dealings with the devil. Number four on this list is from a Reddit user called McCallum Mary. They tell a very interesting story of how their friend got possessed by a demon in a newly purchased house and the ramifications of that. I think they do a good job telling the story, so for the purposes of this video, I'm going to quote their post. When I was in high school, my friend moved into a farmhouse. That house had a barn and a basement with stairs that led to nowhere. The previous owner killed himself in the barn because, and they put this in quotations here, the resident told me to. When moving into this house, my friend would never step into the barn. Not once would she even walk towards it. We thought it would be fun to have a seance because we were young and stupid. We had the candles and everything. I was sitting next to Katie, the one who lived there, and all of a sudden, when asking if whoever was there could show themselves, Katie then squeezed my hand so hard. The candlelight wavered and she turned her head so slow to meet my eyes. What she said, I will never forget. Let's go to the barn. Someone's there who wants to talk to us. I let go of her hand and stood up. My other friends there turned on the lights and she blinked at us. What happened? To this day, she can't remember that night. A week after our seance, her dad was found in that barn. He shot himself, and in his letter he said, I'm sorry, I had to listen, as if something had told him to do it. This is a true story. It could have been coincidences back to back, but it will always scare me. So that's a really interesting story, and it reminded me of a tale that we talked about on this channel previously. In Scotland, many centuries ago, the settlers of the area defied a witch by taking over her land and not upholding the bargain that they'd struck with her. They eventually went on to kill her. This caused this witch to haunt the area and most specifically the barn that was there. Now we don't know where this place was and I would find it an overwhelming coincidence if this happened to be the same Scottish barn, but I wouldn't be surprised if a similar story is what caused a demon to haunt this place. Sadly, I couldn't find out exactly who the demon was in the place the Reddit user described, but it's possible that it has been there for hundreds of years, preying on anyone who enters its lair. Number three on this list is the demon 
Dagon. This demon was prevalent in possessing people during what we call now the Louveniers possessions. This was a series of demonic possessions that occurred at the Louveniers convent in 1647. In this instance, 18 separate individuals claimed that they had been possessed by a demon. This all started with 18 year old sister Madeline Bavent. She was the first victim of these demonic possessions and was the first one to come forward about her story. Up until that point, her life had been very hard and she was often mistreated growing up. If what she claims was actually true, then that mistreatment carried over into her adulthood as well. Father Thomas Boole was the current leader of the convent and succeeded Father Mathurin Picard for the title. Father Mathurin Picard had died earlier that year. However, it was said that both men were responsible for having demons possess these nuns, with Father Picard's spirit being present during the proceedings. It was reported that these two men took Sister Madeleine Bavent to a witch's sabbat, and when they were there, married her to the devil and had him perform sexual acts with her. This was accompanied by the disembowelment and murder of two other men that were present at this ritual. Madeleine referred to the devil as Dagon and said that that was the name that he had given to himself. After Madeline came forth, so did a bunch of other nuns as well. The count finally got up to 18 of them who had come forward and they all told a similar tale. There were also reports of these nuns speaking in tongues, contorting their bodies and levitating just as somebody might if they were possessed by a demon. Public exorcisms were held and the entire town showed up to watch as these nuns were exorcised of the demons that had been forced upon them. Father Thomas Brule was in the thick of it now and there was nothing to save him from being burnt at the stake. However, it's also interesting to note that Madeleine Bavent was also sent to the dungeons to live out the rest of her days. I'm not really sure the logic behind that decision, considering she was the victim of Father Thomas Brule and also the demon Dagon, but I guess they did things differently back then. Number two on this list is the demon Riga. This story comes from another Reddit user. They say that they don't remember any of it, but this happened to them when they were only two years old. Apparently one evening this person, when they were only two, was lying awake in bed and they started screaming at the top of their lungs. Now this isn't completely uncommon for a two year old to do, but what happens next is. I'm going to quote their post here as they say, I got off the bed and started running in circles while screaming and crying in terror. It was not a nightmare since I was awake and I was not playing nor demanding anything since I was just scared out of my mind. Nothing like this had ever happened before. I was the only child in the house. This went on for some random time at night and until dawn. It would only stop at dawn. I did this every single night, non-stop, for six months." End quote. Now that is definitely a strange thing for a two year old to be doing and quite demonic if you ask me. The parents knew that this was a big problem. Their child would claw and bite at them whenever they tried to calm him and they weren't sure how to handle it. Eventually they decided that going to a priest was the right thing to do but even they couldn't find the answer. They apparently visited as many priests as they could but still the problem persisted. That was right up until one priest, while performing a ritual on this child, managed to extract some information. It turns out that a reddit user was possessed by a demon and that demon's name was Riga. They couldn't get a whole lot more information, however they did learn that Riga was an inhabitant of not only the child, but also the home. The parents understood exactly what this meant and wasting no time at all, they moved houses. This clearly was the problem because the second that they got to a new residence, the demonic possession of Riga ceased and their baby, our reddit user, was calm. Sometimes these demons will only possess us for a time and when they get what they want, which in this case was for these people to leave their house, then they'll also leave. Number one on this list is the demon Balbarith. This demon was rampant in possessing people in the Aeon province possessions. Similar to some of the other cases that we've looked at today, this pandemic of possessions made its way through a convent of nuns. Clearly, these nuns really had it rough during the early 17th century. The first report to come out came from Madeleine de Demandalx. She was an aristocrat who joined the Ursuline convent at Marseille in 1607. It wasn't long before she'd reported to the mother superior that she actually had an affair with father Louis Gofferty, who was also at that convent. The mother superior was obviously shocked at this news and thought it best to remove Madeleine and send her to I. This was to get her away from Father Gofferty and distance her from the scandal. It was when she got to her new location though that she started to notice the symptoms of demonic possession. In 1609, Madeleine started to exhibit all of her classic telltale signs. 
This included convulsions, foaming at the mouth, speaking devilish languages, reacting strangely to religious paraphernalia. These symptoms spread like a disease to all of the other nuns that were close to Madeleine and similarly to my other entries on this list, you immediately had a bunch of nuns that were now demonically possessed. These nuns were hit hard with these demonic possessions as well, with a lot of them speaking a voice that wasn't their own. The church responded swiftly and started performing exorcisms as best as they could. Most attempts though were unsuccessful. However, it was during one of these exorcisms in 1910 that Father Gofferty's name was thrown into the mix. Madeline claimed that he seduced her and brought her to a demonic ritual. This ritual was used to summon the demon Balbarith, which then possessed Madeline. Other nuns started to make the same claim and soon Father Gofferty's name was completely run through the dirt. During a session of torture he confessed to the crimes and was sentenced to death. This case of a demon possessing a group of nuns was the first one in France and set the precedent for the other two that I've previously spoken about.